Good morning. Thank you so much for being here at the, the early shift, and it, you will not be disappointed. Uh, my name is John Fawcett. I look after the events programme at the British Library. It's my absolute pleasure to have been working on a programme around the fantasy exhibition. We've had everything from, 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 from Neil Gaiman to f f stories of fairylands to the amazing Susan Cooper's Dark is Rising, uh, and it carries on in the new year, so please do check out. We've got fabulous sessions on Tolkien, on... Um, Angela Carter on world building in fantasy games. So there's lots more to come. But today is a brilliant set of panels in here. I hope some of you are staying all day with us. I know some of you are. Um, you've seen the programme, so I won't bore you with that. But uh, the, the general principles are uh, we're in here. At the end of each session, we unfortunately will need to change, uh, clear the room. But there's an amazing bookstore outside. Uh, so please do pick up copies, and, and our authors and artists will be signing through the day. Um, obviously, in the main building, you have the fantasy exhibition, uh, which has been open since the end of October. We're very, very thrilled by it. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant uh, overview of what we know as the fantasy genre through books, manuscripts, costumes, films, games, and much, much more. So uh, if you do get a chance to see that today or another day before the end of February, I strongly recommend it, and I'm sure you'll love it. Um, greetings to everybody watching the day online. Uh, we've got people from all around the world joining us remotely. Um, we we will have the answer, opportunity for most sessions to put your questions to the speakers and those watching online, uh, there is a form where you can also do that. Uh, you can also buy books online through Newham Books through the tab at the top of the page. So I think that is more than enough for, 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 as, a, as the boring stuff. Today's first panel, Fantasy Maps, obviously a key part of every fantasy book, well, most fantasy books is a good map, uh, as we all agree. Um, we have the fantastic Charles Vest come all the way just for this event from the United States. Uh, we're thrilled with that. Joining him is Ahnet Beirouz, who's, a, who's an artist and academic from Scotland, and especially he'll be talking as well. And they'll be talking with Travis Elborough, who's a good friend of ours, he's a cultural historian, uh, an author of multiple books, almost any topic uh, under the sun, Travis has written a book on it, but he has also written book Atlas of Improbable Places, uh, uh, um, and there's two uh, different volumes of that outside, so maps and place and fantasy are very much part of what he is interested in. And that's it, and welcome to the stage, our panel. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to pour water for a second. So we're prepared. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, John, for your introduction. Um, so, Annette is a, an independent scholar and researcher with a PhD from the University of Edinburgh and also the author of a, a marvellous new book which is coming out next year, which is Mapping Middle-Earth, Environmental and Political Narratives in J.R. Tolkien's Cartographies. Charles Vest kind of almost needs no introduction, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to give him one anyway. But, um, you know, he is a, a figure that whose work, you know, from National Lampoon to Marvel and DC, Spider-Man and Sandman, collaborations with Neil Gaiman, and of course, a four-year-long project working with Ursula Le Guin on the book of Ursi, this absolutely beautiful book, copies of which are outside, and I'm sure Charles would be more than happy to sign them for you, um, but it's an extraordinary piece of work, beautiful, lots of nice maps, of course, as well, there it is, <laughs> <laughs> and so also can, some lovely other labyrinthine sort of Locked room style, most of there. So, um, and that's going to speak. We're gonna, they're both going to speak very briefly first, and then we're just going to have a conversation talking about the whole idea of maps and fantasy and the world. I mean, I, I brought this along with me because it, it, it's, Annette's book uh, mentioned it, which is Treasure Island, the, the Robert Louis Stevenson book, where the story, in a sense, grows from him, his drawing of the map. And this idea of maps in a sense, as 2D representations drawn in lines on pieces of paper is what all writers are doing, really. We're all attempting to make something real for the reader, regardless of the reality that it might mirror or not. And that's the slide between, in a sense, what we might think of as practical cartography and the, and the cartography of fantasy. And even that might be a sort of false analogy. So, Annette, if you'd like to 
kick off with yeah. a few words. Um, so I'm going to try and make this both concise and coherent. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was really interesting that you were talking about like that difference between sort of fantasy mapping and real world mapping. I think with fantasy mapping, we often think of it as like an exercise in world building and illustration. But what my work does, what my book does, is it essentially tries to bring real world mapping back into the conversation um, by thinking about what a map actually is as an object and as a socially constructed object. So we kind of think of maps as something that is objective, especially like modern cartography since the Enlightenment. We, the kind of words that we think around maps is like objective, accurate, neutral, um, but none of this is actually true. Um, maps, like everything else that is knowledge-based, are socially and politically constructed. So like libraries, like history books, like everything, um, they are created by the biases and the politics of the map maker and they are read in a particular way. So the person that reads it and the way that they use it also has a politics behind it. Um, there's a branch of geographical theory which I kind of was looking at, which is called critical cartography, which is essentially all of these ideas. So it kind of thinks about, yeah, maps as kind of forms of knowledge production. So while I was kind of reading about all of this and doing this research into mapping, it kind of struck me that we should be able to, if there are so many maps in fantasy books, we should be able to apply these same principles to fantasy books. Um, and Tolkien especially is such a rich area for that because of the way that Tolkien constructed his world and the way that his literature was produced. So he always kind of had this conceit that the things that he was writing were real. So like the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings were part of like the Red Book of Westmarch that Bilbo had written and that was being passed down. A lot of the history of Middle Earth was like fragments that had been translated from Old English, Middle English through to like now. And so it kind of made sense to think about the maps as also things that were produced within that world, if that makes sense. Um, and so kind of starting from that point, what my book looks at, what my work looks at is thinking about, well, what are the kind of political narratives that then we can read that are in the actual literature within the narrative, but that are within the maps as well? And Tolkien especially is such a really interesting figure when it comes to this. I think he's someone that is often deeply depoliticized. Um, when we think of his environmentalism, we think of him as a guy that liked trees. When we think of him to do with race, a lot of the time, it's just like an argument about whether or not he's racist and it's just like all quite reductive um but he was someone that was writing the lord of the rings came out about 10 years before the start of anthropocene literature like it was before the start of like on the cusp of the environmental movement um the anthropocene had started when he was writing um and he was writing also in the kind of dying days of the british empire and he was born in the heyday of the british empire and narratives of environmentalism ecological harm um geological harm and colonialism are really like rich in the books and they are really rich in the maps as well and we can see how the characters I'm not really sure what order the slides are in <laughs> but like with Thor's map for example we can see that the way the characters um like build on things um it'll be up there at some point <laughs> um, but we can see that the way that it, yeah so like this map is used within the hobbit as a political map it is a way for someone to regain like an indigenous population essentially to regain their homeland the even the drawing of the dragon that is like a political drawing it shows who has power over the land at that point um and so yeah all of his maps kind of have this the way that the characters engage with them, the way that the characters engage with land is profoundly political. And I think for me, literature has always been something that is really political. And I think it often in fantasy, we have a reluctance to think about it that way. Or if we do think about it that way, it's in that very Game of thrones -y, like who is fighting who? Um, and I think politics is a lot more about power, really. And I think he was reflecting narratives of power within, within the books and the maps. So yeah. That's very brief. I hope that was coherent. <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> great. That's, yeah, yeah, what I do. Charles. I, I, again, I don't know which direction we're going to do with these. <laughs> I think these are, some of, these are some of yours, not the Peter Pan one. And the, 
benevolent one. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, there's a clicker there you if you want to. to. Well, no, but Which if way? you want to. Green uh, or red? I think green. I think it's green. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but your, Charles, your, your, your relationship with, with maps and fantasy, where's that? With my relationship with maps, uh, in, uh, when I was uh, 12 years old and, and read the first uh, paperback edition of uh, Tolkien, I was fascinated with the map, uh, as I was fascinated with the cover, which I could not understand why, what it was illustrating in the book, but it also made me stare at it. The map made me stare at it and think about all the stories that could happen in there. And uh, that was fascinating to me because you it's, weirdly enough, a map is almost abstract in that sense. And it creates what I like to call a, a poetic space where the reader and the writer or the artist can collaborate on the story they're telling. And it gives you spaces that that reader can wander into and wonder, well, what's there? Um, so when I, I, the last book I finished uh, that I can talk about uh, <laughs> is... Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a code of there's secrecy I've got a fascinating <laughs> sounding new project. But, but it, it's a limited edition of uh, J.M. Barry's Peter Pan stories. And uh, the p publisher asked me to do uh, in papers that would be maps of Neverland and uh, Kensington Gardens. And uh, that, it was really a fascinating thing to do. Uh, there's a map that I believe Rackham did or was published in the Rackham edition of Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens. Uh, but I was also trying to, I wanted to draw my own, but I also wanted to draw it as if it was done in... I'm not going to remember the year, whenever the book was first yeah. published, over to yonder. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that, it was interesting. The pictures, I would go online. I'm based in Virginia. Uh, I can't just walk over to Kensington Gardens and look at things. <laughs> and it wouldn't do it anyway because the book was published in the early part of the 19, uh, 1900s, and I'm not there. Uh, and it's very changed. A lot of things have changed. So it was... A, a weird looking at reality, uh, photographs and maps, and then faded photographs of uh, postcards, and coming up with what it might look like. Uh, but I've been, uh, I think I was supposed to introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> I've been uh, uh, working as a professional illustrator for almost 50 years. Uh, I've done many, many things. Uh, 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 many, many books. Uh, worked a lot with Neil Gaiman. Stardust has some maps in it. Um, but uh, I, I really enjoy working with uh, fantasy. The evocativeness of it really ex excites me. And the fact that I don't think in terms of hard edges. My brain just doesn't, looks at a spaceship and doesn't go there. And looks at Modern architecture is a little bit hard, although I did a Spider-Man graphic novel and did about six pages in New York City. And that was, you know, there's a lot of windows in New York City. <laughs> a lot of windows, so you get tired of it. But I had a roommate, uh, another artist, who told me that the way he would draw buildings is when he would draw a window, he'd think about who lived inside of that and tell himself a story as he was drawing the window. And they all are always a better drawing that way. So I tried to emulate that. But then I sent him to Scotland. <laughs> and uh, th there were not as many windows there. <laughs> uh, so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a darker, darker country in some respects, <laughs> weather-wise. You don't, you don't want to look out too much. Go through these. Keep warm. <laughs> OK, that's not going anywhere. Am I not pointing in the right direction? It will. No. Oh, and this. Uh, this is Ursula Gwynn's redrawn map of Ursi. And it's redrawn because when she was first writing the book, uh, she had, do you know what uh, butcher paper is? It's brown, very cheap brown paper in a roll that you put meat and everything in, steak. Uh, but she had a big roll of butcher paper for her kids to draw on. And uh, they were away. I think her uh, husband had taken them somewhere. 
and she rolled out a big sheet that filled up the uh, dining room table and started drawing her what she was seeing in her head as earth sea. And it was hand drawn and uh, she finished and she put in all these names. She hadn't really dreamed up all the stories yet, but she just put names in there. And uh, eventually she lost in some move or something, she lost that map and had to recreate it. But she said from then on, she had this map and when she would think about writing a short story or another novel, She'd just look at the map and see a name that she'd put down and wonder who would live there and then start telling the stories. Uh, and I, I found that really fascinating. I would love to see her original uh, map, but it's you know, probably trashed somewhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this is Stardust. Uh, the original edition of this book, uh, Neil wrote it for me to draw and I did 175 color illustrations in it, paintings. And uh, this is uh, young Tristan, who's the hero, has this ability to know where any place is in, in that world. And they've crossed the wall, and they're into fairy, and, uh, it, which is a thing that I like about maps, is you can, it's, it's almost an imaginary space. Uh, and you can uh, visualize anything you want, and your eraser is a mighty tool. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and uh, I needed, uh, I did this before I knew anything about Photoshopping, and there's a couple misspellings in there, because <laughs> if it's me, there will always be misspelling. Mm. It's just the way I am. And Neil, that is not the way you spell that. <laughs> and, oh, well, uh, nowadays I'd be able to change that. But uh, it would be tedious, but I would change it. <laughs> uh, and uh, Earth, I was just, I, I was asked to show a couple pictures of my work. This is from Earth Seed. This is, Ursula called this my Tiepolo composition. Uh, and she had. For the 50 years, the book, uh, our book was published 50 years to the, from the time the first Wizard of Earthsea was published. And except for the very first edition by the small press, Parnassus, I think, uh, Ged had always been portrayed as a white man on the cover of every book, no matter how she argued uh, that that's not how he was described. Uh, and all the marketing departments say, well, we can't sell a book with a black person on the cover. Or It really wasn't a black person. It was more of a, a Mediterranean, uh, dark-skinned uh, person. And uh, this was the first time she got... I, I spent quite a long time trying to crawl inside her brain and see the world the way she saw it and draw it that way. So she was very excited to see some, you know, Ged drawn in. A proper color. She sent me, I was talking about this earlier, uh, her father was an anthropologist and he spent quite a bit of time with uh, Native Americans, northwest coast of America, Native Americans. And he had a picture, she sent me a picture of uh, her father standing next to two Native Americans and one of them, the one in the middle, she said, that's Ged. And uh, I lost the picture in a in, a, in my computer crash of several years ago. I'm sure she has it somewhere in an archive. But it was a very exciting, uh, it was four years of intense collaboration, uh, thousands and thousands of emails. Uh, and I was planning on uh, finishing up the work and going out to visit her and showing her all the originals. She had seen them on online and approved or asked for as for changes, her biggest change was always, Charles, can you put some more goats in there? Can you put more chickens? I want chickens in that. Uh, she was very, she, she wanted the every day in the pictures and not the golden halls of heroes. There we go. This is a piece from myself. Uh, it's called the, uh, the King of Summer and His Bride of Flowers. Um, and it's uh, the type of picture I like to do. It's a green man. I'm very interested in the green man mythology. Um, 
and all the flowers are from the yard of the house I was living in then. Uh, and it's to have uh, there. Mm-hmm. One of the things I really like to do with uh, when I'm not illustrating a book is to do a picture that has a narrative impulse uh, but has no physical narrative that it's tied to. So you can give it a, a an evocative name and and hopefully, if it works, it, each person that looks at it will tell their own story. And I think that's really interesting that they could be, uh, this is called the um, Gathering the Worlds. And it's, uh, in my mind, it was a uh, Earth Mother t- uh, demonstrating how to make new worlds out of old to this young girl. And I put, I don't know whether you can see how big, okay. And I put in all the animals that I really like. Uh, uh, foxes, uh, rabbits, uh, owls. Uh, and there's even, if you're familiar with Miyazaki, there's a Totoro uh, in there somewhere. <laughs> Over there on the left. Uh, you can see him from the back. You have to be careful, he is trademarked. But I, I, love, <laughs> I, love the bo- I love that movie and I love the the what it's saying so it's uh, so this is uh, what I I like to do is create that poetic space and let everyone uh, collaborate uh, uh, this is from the Peter Pan uh, and this I, I got online and I, I spent a lot of time on Google and uh, I found a picture of an actual tree in Kensington Gardens and went I'm going to use this and I so this tree somewhere is over there. Uh, and the fairies, too, I suspect, if you're there at the right time. So. And this is from my unknown, unnamed project that I'm working on right now for the Folio Society. And I'm doing it with a, a, in colored pencil uh, and rubbing, lots of rubbing. I have a rag, this scrap, scrappy rag that I found one day that has exactly the right texture to move the color around a bit, and it's really fun to play with it. So, Brilliant. thank you very much, Charles. I think that's, that's absolutely it. Beautiful. And here we are. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's an interesting connecting point there with some of the stuff that's in your book, in it, which is the um, you, when you write about Tolkien, and particularly the Thor's map, you you describe that as being and having an, a sort of itinerary map. Mm. Has a has a purpose to it, yeah. um, and what, what also becomes really plain is how much effort Tolkien and his son Christopher went into the maps and how they would change them as they were, as they were, they were doing. Them, which I think ties in a way with Charles's thing about his non-map work, i.e., trying to create create a story. But I think you make plain in with Tolkien there was lots of you know rejigging, and you talk about the way that both the cartography and the story would would grow together. Mm. How I mean, how do you how did you see their relate their relationships within yeah you know, that genre as it were? I think it's really there are like some kind of there's um, so a collection of his letters that you can buy and they're kind of letters that he's sort of like written throughout his life um, and the ones where he talks about making the maps are so funny because he is having the worst time of his life. <laughs> like there are just so many him just being like, I am in crisis and I have a day to do this and I don't know how to do this and it's just not working out, which is like, which is incredibly relatable. Um, but yeah, I think the interesting thing about how they work together, so Christopher, his son, was really instrumental in drawing a lot of the maps from Lord of the Rings um, and they kind of collaborated and worked together. So he would do the draft map, but then Christopher would like come in and he was... Um, in the war, like a lot of, so it was kind of a really tricky thing to coordinate at the time. Um, But I think it kind of, their relationship and how they approach the maps and especially that idea of accuracy, I think is a really interesting complication of how we think about Tolkien's Mm -hmm. maps. So things like Thor's map, but even like the map of Middle Earth, even um, like the Rohan Gondor Mordor one, we think of them as very medieval, really. Like, these are very, like, archaic. They have that kind of medieval, rustic charm that we think of with Middle Earth. But the way that they drew the maps and the way that they were so obsessive, like, if he changed 
a part of the narrative where it would take them a day longer to get to this one place, he would have to redraw the whole map because he was like, well, it can't take, now the place is further away. So now I have to redraw it and I have to get my son to redraw it, which like that is, it's very yeah. cute, but also I would have, <laughs> I would have noped out a long time ago. <laughs> um, but it is really interesting how that idea of accuracy was really, really important mm. to them. And accuracy is not a medieval function of like medieval cartography did not work in terms of accuracy medieval cartography worked in terms of ideology mm. um so if you think about um Mapa Mundi, they all had jerusalem at the center because that was the kind of heart of christianity um and so it was at the center of the map they weren't intended to be ways of understanding how the world fit together they were ways of portraying how people saw the world and so there's a really interesting kind of tension in Tolkien's maps because they are supposedly medieval and the two of them did a lot in terms of that iconography and that imagery and making them feel old and of another time and of another world. But the way that they function and the way that that collaboration worked was they work in terms of how modern cartography works, which is that they are accurate maps that are intended to get you to a certain place and for you to navigate the landscape. Um, and for you to essentially have power over the landscape, like all of the characters in Tolkien, pretty much with the exception of the Ents, are trying to have some sort of power over the land, whether that's for good or bad. Um, even the good guys are essentially trying to, yeah, have power over it, understand it, have knowledge over it in a way that then enables them to traverse it safely and to overcome whatever obstacles it throws at them. Um, and yeah, so it was really interesting reading those letters and how they kind of collaborated together because it said a lot about how he saw the function of the maps in the books. Um, uh, and Charles, similarly, when, when you were saying about how when you were thinking about the illustrations for the Peter Pan and the, and the Barry, you were going back to Edwardian or Georgian sources of that period yes. to, to get inspiration in a way. But how, how conscious of you of, of not... I mean, it's something I know that I think Ursula Le Guin herself with her own max was trying to avoid some of the the the, the full-on medieval stuff how conscious are you of which times frame and and the audience who's going to read to in, see the map are you thinking that they need they in a sense want to be plunged back into something like the edwardian society or do you look at edwardian maps i mean you looked at edwardian kind of they they have those beautiful some but neverland has no yeah attachment to the real world whatsoever yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I played on that, but uh, with Kensington Gardens it was a little bit harder because you were sort of tied to a time period. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also didn't want it to be stiff, uh -huh. yeah. and uh, I just played around with it. And it, I just I, I made a map that I liked. Yeah. Basically, well, it's, <laughs> all the art I make is, yeah, yeah. I like this. Yeah, this yeah. is, I, I want to be looking I mean, at that. I mean, the so. difference, I suppose, with A.E. J. and Barry isn't there to go, hang on a minute, that's wrong. Whereas, uh, whereas, <laughs> and unfortunately now, whereas Ursula Le Guin, yes. uh, in your collaboration, yes. there was about to say, no, Charles, that, you know, right. and, and how, how did that, is that something, you know, you were, obviously you said there were tons and tons of emails backwards and forwards, but oh, did she, have a very, she had a very clear idea, I think. Very clear she... idea of what it was. And you know, she even drew some. Mm -hmm. And she would, <laughs> she sent me a postcard of, of a dragon when we were trying to come up with what her dragon looked like. And she said, well, you have to excuse me. I, I couldn't figure out how to draw the wings so I didn't put them on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I wish I could say that. <laughs> you know? But I mean, like, so that's something. So there's an expectation within the genre that the dragon should look a certain way, even though you may be able well, to shift it. It was. Uh, it, uh, there were, I think, three or four publishers that had the rights to the various books in the Ursi, mm -hmm. and um, Saga, who's a division of Simon and Schuster, was publishing this collection, and uh, Joe Monty, who was the Idea, he came up with the idea of doing this, and mm -hmm. working with me and doing all this stuff. Uh, he had to spend a long time negotiating those rights. Mm. And so Ursula and I had, we knew we were going to do the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had maybe 10 months, 11 months while they were negotiating. And, that, and we decided instead of just not doing anything, mm. waiting for 
Yeah. Okay, now it's signed. Mm -hmm. uh, we just started, I started sending drawings of dragons. Mm. And uh, then she would make comments. Mm -hmm. uh, that's too male. That's too this. That, mm. you know, that's, and uh, so back and forth and back and forth, I have, a, you know, a hundred drawings of dragons till we got to it. And <laughs> there was like uh, little things like the, the, horns were going this way and she went, no, I want them that way and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a really interesting, fun, mm -hmm. really project. She's, you know, really smart woman yeah. and knew how to articulate yeah. and, uh, and didn't suffer fools very easily <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I think we can uh, imagine some of them. <laughs> yeah, yes. There were some interesting comments about politics all the way through this yeah, yeah. too. Uh, so she was a fascinating person to uh, get to know, and uh, I didn't mind at all. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, an eraser is the most useful tool any artist or, yeah. or writer, for that matter, has. You know, editing, changing. Yeah. You should never be married to one thing. You should be able to keep changing it, mm -hmm. and, um, <coughs> and we did. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, one of the things you mentioned about Tolkien, of course, was that, that he served in the First World War. Mm -hmm. And there is some correlation, in a way, within some of the, the sort of Middle Earth maps and the trench war maps that he would have studied yeah. in, in, that, in that period mm -hmm. and how the battle maps and, and those sort of things. But you also make the point that often some of the, some of the, when we saw that on the map there, um, of Thor's map, you know, Mirkwood, where it says, you know, there are spiders. So the text is also important as well as the... The, the illustration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, so he specialised in map reading in the First World War. That was like a big part of what he did. Um, and you can see that kind of carry over. I'm going to try and make this work. I cannot promise anything. How do you do this? Oh, there we go. No. The other butt. There we go. Okay, yeah. yeah. Hopefully I'll stay there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like we can see a lot of, the sort of like visuals of what he was working with, with like trench maps, um, with the map of uh, Rohan Gondor and Mordor, which is one of the few to actually feature contour lines, which is again like a really, really modern practice. Um, I think one thing that I found really interesting while I was researching all of this is that modern cartography, uh, as we understand it, is based in warfare. Um, so the Ordnance Survey map, which I think is what a lot of us think of when we think of like the modern, really accurate, really like neutral map, um, was created after the Jacobite uprising because they physically couldn't find the rebels in the highlands, which I think is so funny. <laughs> so they had to make a map because they couldn't traverse the highlands like it was such a hostile landscape that they began to map the region in a way that was accurate um, to squash the loss of the uprising. And that eventually it turned into what is like a leisure map, a tourist map, a walking map. But that was its original purpose. Um, and mapping in the British Empire was a really huge thing, like the mapping of India, the mapping of Africa. In a lot of um, imperial texts like Heart of Darkness, um, there is huge discussions of mapping. Like it's always been a tool of war. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how he carried over some of those ideas that he would have been doing. You can see some of the trench maps that he worked with that they have like annotations about, well, this part of the barbed wire has like fallen down or this like has moved. And it was like a kind of working thing. And it was what stood between you, like life and death essentially. Um, and we can see a lot of that then happening in this. This map especially is essentially the closest thing to a war map that any of the kind of Middle Earth texts have because it is where the large part of the kind of showdown, as it was, in Return of the King happens. Um, and it's interesting that it is the map that has borrowed the most from that kind of war aesthetic. Um, but it is absolutely encoding a certain kind of power and a kind of tension. The other thing you mentioned... Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Um, Jump in, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Ordnance survey maps. I mm. loved them. I used, to buy, I used to come over to England and Scotland and, and traipse around in the middle of nowhere and loved it. And you get these maps. And uh, I remember I was with my wife and we may, we were either up in the Highlands or on the Orkneys. And we had these maps and they were fascinating to look at. And they would have this sort of strange little dotted thing and it'd be tumuli. 
<laughs> and we'd go there. And I remember one day spending quite half the day trying to find this particular <laughs> tumuli. <laughs> and finally we realized that it's something they know is under the ground, but they don't have the money to dig it up. <laughs> so, you, yeah. you, so immediately my imagination would kick into yeah. play going, oh, it could yeah. be this, it could be that. And it really was a sort of a, a, in all these maps that had all these very particular, uh, like this, only mm -hmm. it was you know, the landscape you were standing in. Uh, but there were these imaginary spots all over it. And I thought that yeah. was fascinating and wonderful. Well, I mean, that, that thing of the, the semi-fictional as well. I mean, yes. there were supposed to be errors in the, the London A to Z in order to stop people copy, copyright, copying it. Like ripping them off, I, they could check if someone else had stolen the map because there would be something encoded in <laughs> the map itself as a sort of get out clause. But, but I'm, I'm intrigued also in that with the um, right about how also with, with Thor's map and The Hobbit that Tolkien wanted it originally to be like a fold out yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm struck that's very much of that interwar and in post war period where like you'd have a ward's travel guide to a tick place and it would have a fold, it would tell you the places you would go to and then you'd have the fold out map so you could negotiate it yeah. so it's embedded in a way is that idea that the, the, the book almost has its own like you could, the idea that you know you could unfold the map and off you could go somehow yeah isn't it? Yeah, yeah yeah absolutely um like i think he always saw them and i think that's why i always tried to resist that idea of them being paratextual because mm. i think he really saw them as part of the text Thoreau's map is a really interesting example of that because he um originally wanted it to be a pull-out map, but they couldn't afford it, like just in terms of publishing constraints. And so they were get, they kind of put it at the back of the book, like inside mm -hmm. the cover. And so they had to turn it. And so east faces up, which is also what a lot of medieval cartography did. That it was east oriented because of the whole Christian thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really interesting that he kind of copied that but then within the, again, the conceit of the book and within his own logic, he was like, well, dwarvish maps face east. And it, was, it became part of the thing mm. that any sort of publishing constraint, any sort of material, real world thing would become part of the production of the map in world. Mm. And so he was always, I think, really aware of them not as illustrations, yeah. I think, yeah. which is really, I, I can't really think of another author who did it in that same way. Mm. I don't know if you can. Yeah, he was kind of special in that way. <laughs> <laughs> but Charles, I mean, the, the idea of the risk the restraints about of publishing, what you can get. What restraints? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are there any? I mean, have you? Have, are there any of maps that you, or, you know, or even illustrations where your vision for what they should be has been compromised in some way by what what can be printed? <laughs> Only by deadline. <laughs> <laughs> um, depends. Uh, I guess it's been a long time since I've worked with a, a, a publisher that I. A skin I would just well. say <laughs> no, <laughs> no and walk away. Yeah, uh, it's more people that are you know publishers that I respect that I, mm -hmm. and I enjoy working with. Um, I guess after all these years, I've got to a certain point where I can, I, you know, if I don't want to do it, I just don't do yeah. it. Sure, uh, kind of thing. But I mean, has it, has it, have any books that you've encountered you feel been spoiled by the poor quality of the, the, mm. the reproductions or? Well, sure, but that yeah. it's been a long time yeah, yeah. since I since yeah. you know there were w books that I did a whole series of um, oh I won't remember the publisher Magic Quest novels mm -hmm. uh, uh, that Terry Windling was the editor of at the beginning and then some other people took it on and they were reprintings of uh, novels that had already been published but not in specifically mm -hmm. in the fantasy genre mm -hmm. and they had me doing little black and white. Uh, frontispieces for each mm -hmm. one of the books mm -hmm. and uh, they were reproduced terribly mm -hmm. I mean reproduction of books was awful for a very long time it's one of the reasons why you don't desperately go back to the 1940s and buy an art book that was mm -hmm. published then because it's going to be blurry mm -hmm. and, and the color won't be good and the black and white is actually worse mm -hmm. worse uh, printing than the color yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one of the things I, but you could still you learn a lot from that sort of blurriness. Mm -hmm. You can start projecting into it. I, I, the town I grew up in had no art museum, no art galleries, no bookstore, none of that. And my mother had this little cl uh, collection called One Hundred and One Masterpieces of Art, mm 
<laughs> I don't know who picked these pieces because I, I actually have the that book mm. now, and it it was a little book, and each page would uh, uh, talk about the artist, and it came with these, you might call them postcards, but they were on such slim paper that you know, and the reproduction was so bad, uh, but again, this was the kind of thing you, you'd look at a. A painting, and you could sort of project into it, and and it wasn't uh, one of these hard-edged, finished pictures. That it's something I don't appreciate in art, or really in anything. But uh, <laughs> the when there there's such a hard border edge that there's no room for your imagination to work with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at it and go, "That's very beautifully done," and that's the last time you'll. What, the last thing you'll think about. You go on and on, on to the next thing. There's nothing to uh, wrap your mind around mm -hmm. because it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, current illustrators that do that super finished work, and mm -hmm. I, I just find it boring. Mm -hmm. there's, again, there's no poetic space to yeah. work for the viewer to work with. And then again, this idea of fantasy. And, and reality and what, what the, and, and I think your book makes a very good case, you know, for the, some of the kind of veracity of what Tolkien was attempting to do. And, I mean, does Tolkien set the template then, really, for what other, for what, what follows afterwards as far as the fantasy map genre goes? Is it, is he the sort of, you know, the ur uh of that? And, and maybe, Charles, you can also comment about whether, whether, where is, fan, where are fantasy maps going are they growing? <laughs> kind of, you know, is there a, a, a trajectory? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, because uh, I think... certainly set, set yeah. the impulse. Yeah. Uh, and uh, publishers want it. Uh, readers want it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's more and more and more of them. Um, books devoted on them. Whatever. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's really fascinating on that. Mm -hmm. But, it, um, you know, I... Someone... Someone should do a map. I don't know if anyone here has ever read Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I, I loved them when I was 10 years old and I can't read them now. They're just <laughs> excruciatingly badly written for, for me, for me. Some people yeah. love them, but I think it would be really fascinating to do a map of Tarzan's Africa, for instance. It would just, because it, it was, you know, Every single book he bumped into another lost civilization, you'd have to all these things. It, it would be kind of interesting yeah. to do, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to read, a challenge for you in the room or, out, or elsewhere. But, I mean, you, it, you, you quote uh, Dinah Wynne Jones, where uh, slight, I think slightly sarcastically, oh, she yeah, says, you know, great. she said <laughs> in her guide to Fantasyland, where she says, you know, find the map, and then there's a slightly, there's bound to be one yeah. as a kind of slightly, <laughs> yes. like, you know, yes. are we a bit. Are we over this? Is this kind of, is this all we've got? We're trapping ourselves with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's an interesting question. I think that idea that he, like, set the tone for it, I think is probably almost definitely yeah. true. Um, I do think a lot of his maps that are the most interesting and curious are the ones that actually weren't even published. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny that we've kind of latched onto the two or three examples that are in the published books, but it's when you kind of look at the wealth, like, the mm -hmm. breadth of it, that it becomes something that is really particular to any other author that mm -hmm. I can like think of. Um, but he did definitely, I think, set a standard for it as to whether that is kind of overdone or not. I think it's a tool like any other literary tool. Mm -hmm. I do think it would be interesting if people thought of them as part of the text a bit more in the way that he did. Mm -hmm. I think that's like definitely an avenue that hasn't been explored as much. Um, but what I actually find really interesting about that sort of kind of area is that he definitely wasn't the first. No. And I think we think of him as like, well, he set the tone, he set the standard. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a map in Thomas More's Utopia yeah. in like the 1500s or 1400s, 1500s. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, like we've been, like John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress was illustrated, obviously like J.M. Mm -hmm. Barry, Winnie the Pooh, um, greatest maps ever. Um, yeah, yeah, but it has been like a tradition. I think what he did was he kind of embedded it he made it real in a way, mm -hmm. in the way that his characters interacted with it. And then since then, they've kind of been treated once more as an illustrative device, but using the same mm -hmm. code that he used. Um, and I would like know, to see it. Do you know if, um, 
you know, the massive fairyland map. Have you seen it yet? Have no, you been down to the yet. exhibition? No. I I was just I wonder if everything is from a different from various books mm. or whether he made up anything as he was going along because it's <laughs> you know it's massively long and thousands and thousands of little worlds are named in this fairyland map but I I didn't there were too many people pressing in I couldn't, <laughs> you know, couldn't read every little bit of it but I did get a rollout map I'm be able to look at it oh uh, that's exciting but it you know is it are they all made up? Are, did did that artist make them up, or are they from literature? Is yeah, it, yeah, all that, of them, or is it a, a mixture? I would really be interested. Yeah, in knowing that because there would definitely be you. You could make like an unending map. I yes. think of every yes. kind of world that's been created for sure. Well, you mentioned this. This uh, it's Lewis Carroll and Borges have this idea yeah. of the one-to-one -one scale map, where essentially the country becomes the map because yeah. in order to get accuracy, and I think this is the thing, isn't it, that maps are always fictional mm. to a certain extent. Because and again, there's a, a Calvino, the great Italian writer, had this lines that you know maps are always conceived in terms of narrative because yeah. it's about the idea of going on a journey. And even if you're not going anywhere, the map takes us somewhere else in, yeah. you know, in physical space or mental mm -hmm. space as much as anything else. Yeah. When, when I was, I don't know, let's say 14, I was briefly fascinated with the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I found this book of maps mm -hmm. at the uh, public library in Lynchburg that they finally got. And... Uh, you know, it had each one of the major battles, and it would just be a map. And if you, and then the next page would be describing the battle and who did what, who did mm. what. But you just look at the map, and and again, you, it took an exercise of imagination to see the people running around on that little mm. landscape. But it was mm. really interesting. I liked, I mm. enjoyed doing that. But I, you know, it didn't. In the end, I was, it, it didn't uh, quite catch my imagination as much mm. as uh, I think Tolkien came along. Yeah. Those maps yeah, yeah, just yeah. <laughs> gone. So. I think we now should open it up actually to, to the audience. We have questions from the room and some uh, from people, people online. Does, um, do, uh, do we have a, we're going to row you, Mike, I think, haven't we? So, uh, I mean, some hands very quick there. So, uh, this gentleman in the hat was, was, was off the mark very speedily, so I think he... <laughs> if you wait two seconds for... Uh, the mic, it's just, it's just down there. So about f row four. Uh, hello, sorry, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say I express my great appreciation as well for the opportunity. Um, my question particularly is directed towards uh, Mr. Charles Vess. Um, a map as a cartographical, cartographical uh, object, as a tool, can provide information with regards to topography. With an emphasis towards accuracy and authenticity, I was wondering as to where you think the dichotomy between conveying information journalistically and the creation of an artistic artefact can exist, considering quality through a frame of fantasy, of axiology, aesthetic, style, and as a seemingly magical source of potency towards an individual's imagination. <laughs> quite a question, but yeah, That's yeah, yeah quite a question, yeah. but, but a great one. Yeah, uh, in, you know, any the map is uh, lines on paper with various indications on it, and it's there for your brain and mind and imagination to play with, and uh, and there's always spaces on it that aren't described in whatever narrative it may come from, and you can project into it and and tell the stories that should have been there. The, you know, the story might all be happening on one side of the mountain and you wonder what happens on the other side. And it's, again, it's, uh, to me, it's part of the uh, activating the uh, readers, the viewers' imagination and letting them participate in the story, which I think is the most important thing any artist or writer can do. So, and it, hope that helps. I don't, do you add anything, add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I obviously don't kind of approach it from that same artistic perspective, but I guess I would question the idea of it having any kind of journalistic integrity whatsoever. <laughs> <Essentially>. <laughs> like, I don't know if that necessarily, I think that's the idea that we have of it, but I think in a way, actually, every map, whether it is a fantasy one or whether it is a real world one, is essentially an artistic rendering in some way, um, because it's not real what it's showing 
and it's made with a kind of bias and a purpose, I suppose. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, the tube map is one of the classic examples, yeah, that, isn't yeah, it? Where yeah. it's a diagraphical map, and the idea is it helps you move around the tube. It has no relationship to the physicality. Of yeah, I remember I once saw the tube map, like when I was a teenager, how it actually looked yeah. like on the yeah. map, and I was just like, what is that? They <laughs> 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 <I> look nuts. <laughs> Hi, yep. um, I think so. Yeah, brilliant panel. And Charles, I, that Earthsea volume is one of my treasured uh, things. My question really is for Anna Heat. Um, I really like what you're doing in terms of the centrality of Tolkien's maps. It's something I'm trying to do with my work on his languages because I co edited Secret Advice with Demetra. And, you know, and, I, and what I've been working on is how, to, how the languages are not paratext, but they are central. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I thought was interesting when you started talking about the other maps that we didn't talk about, because interestingly, when you look at Tolkien's early maps, he is almost more in that medieval kind of mode. When you look at the Veni Kamen map yeah. that he did, that looks like a Viking ship and everything. So as you looked at all of Tolkien's maps, how do you see his thinking changing, moving more towards the kind of maps that are kind of placing his world in a reality, basically, and that, mm -hmm. that real specific focus on getting at the distances right. Do you think that's lending itself to the kind of the inner consistency of reality that Tolkien was trying to achieve in his world building? Yeah, that's really interesting. First of all, hi. <laughs> it's nice to see you again. Um, yeah, I think you can kind of see like the Ivana Kemen map, which I wish we could show you, but it's uh, deeply copyrighted, um, <laughs> looks like a ship. It's in the Book of Lost Tales, <laughs> but I can't show you up here. Um, but it looks like a Viking ship, but it's the world. So like, there are kind of layers of air and land that kind of correspond to parts of the ship. Um, and it's like one of the kind of first ones that he drew. I think in terms of like how he started paying attention to distances, I think, again, that was probably a concern of like publishing in a way, of like the books that were published had like this kind of... They're the ones that I noticed have like a kind of functionality to them, I suppose. But I think even looking at the history of Middle Earth, there are ones like the Ambarakanta maps that have that aren't necessarily in that same medievalist. Like I think the Ambarakanta maps are really interesting because they look like quite modern, almost like geological cross sections of things. Um, yeah. So I I think from what I've kind of noticed, like that sort of started to change. I guess the less also mythological, I think the Book of Lost Tales is like a deeply kind of mythic mode of writing that then kind of started transforming more and more into like a more traditional narrative the more that the history of Middle Earth goes on. Um, so I think it also corresponds to the mode of writing potentially that he was doing. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think it is really interesting how that kind of shifted and how he was using. And I think in the book, what I talk about is that they're not either modern or medieval. It is this kind of coming together of the two. It's what like Umberto Eco calls like the pseudo medieval, right? Like it's that idea of we use like a medieval aesthetic only to draw attention to what the, actually how not medieval it is, how it is kind of encoding different types of um, like modern ideology. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does. Okay, Thank you. great. <laughs> so we take take one hit, then we'll go to someone online just so they don't feel forgotten and just because they're not here so they should be allowed to stay as well so the gentleman there then we'll have one on and then hope maybe a couple more from the room okay hello thanks very much um the question for Anhit. um similar to charles's tumuli example is there like a favorite element of the maps that you've studied or you've analyzed that has like a massive impact on you or your studies or just is funny and your favorite thing oh man oh no there's so many maps <laughs> Um, there's something with the Ambarakanta maps. Um, so they're the maps in the shaping of Middle Earth that show the way that the geology of Middle Earth changes. Again, I can't show them here. Um, but there's one of them that shows the world after the cataclysm, so after ne the drowning of Numenor. Um, and the drowning of Numenor is like one of my favorite parts of Tolkien's mythology. It's just deeply haunting and so sad. <laughs> and you can tell that it was something that was deeply personal to him as well. He talks about like dreaming of the Atlantis haunting a lot and he kind of gave that dream to Faramir in the books as well so it's just like this really beautiful thing um, and in one of the maps you have like the straight line to like Valinor um, which is like a path that 
in theory, used to be a thing that you could like physically go to, to like the undying lands, and then after Numenorians were deeply annoying, they kind of <laughs> reformed the earth and they made it like a globe, and then the straight line became almost this like metaphysical thing. But it's on the map. Like it becomes like a physical component of the map. It's like a line that runs in tangent that you can see. Um, and it's like an encoding of time, really. Like it's an encoding of like this very complicated relationship that the books have with mortality, immortality. Um, but it's a physical thing that's on the map. And I think that's just really cool. Um, so I do really like that one. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know how a lot of like what I researched was like quite sad and traumatic like it's a lot about like environmental damage and colonialism so <laughs> there wasn't that much that was funny but there was a lot that was like deeply just profound and meaningful I think and showed the ways that he was like thinking about it um in a, a way that I don't think we've really acknowledged before um, and that was one of them that I've always just thought was really beautiful yeah great thank you <laughs> thank you so question, Joan, I think you're going to read one of the questions from our, yeah. our audience, wherever you are. Hello, we haven't forgotten you. <laughs> Far away. Yeah, so um, this is from Anna Maria. What advice would you give someone who is creating a map for their book? <laughs> <laughs> Charles, I think you should. Mm, use your eraser a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, think... Uh, Make a map that maybe your the story you're writing then has only a small part in there, and then you make your world bigger uh, and uh, allow space for the reader to wander around in it. Mm -hmm. That's all I would say. Any pitfalls you think? I mean, I'm not an artist, but I would say, <laughs> like, think of the ways the map can be used and also misused I guess like think of it as a sort of object that has like function and that someone can bring their own desires and horrible little thoughts to <laughs> I guess I would say <laughs> do, we, do we have one more from outside do we have another question Jonah yeah no no all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um the, the woman here in the blue Then we'll come to the gentleman on, on to her right there. Um, this thing on? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you were discussing the fact that Neverland has no relation to reality because it's Neverland. And obviously Middle Earth is, although it was set in a sort of pseudo-historical, yeah. it's fantasy. Um, I'm, many years ago I was talking to, um, I was in a lovely conversation with Scott Lynch and he was talking about Lankmar, the city, or however we're pronouncing it. Um, in a particular fantasy book that he loved. And then the, he found a map of the city. And he said that actually he found that that reduced the city in scale to him. Because when he was reading the books, it was this wild place where the characters were drunk a lot of the time and were wandering through the city, not quite sure where they were going. Um, and I contrast that to say um, the, I can't remember his name, I'm sure someone in the audience knows, the gentleman who wrote, who drew the Ankh Morpork map for mm. Terry Pratchett, who literally used the book to inform where the places were in the map. So it's like, okay, if you look out that window, you should be able to see the tower of the university, so it has to be this close and that sort of thing. Um, so my question is, um, when is a map an addition to the tale in fantasy? When does it grow the imagination? And when does it reduce the sense of wonder in question. the tale? Um, <laughs> this is sort of the same thing. Uh, you just have to leave space. If you want it to be, uh, to not reduce, to expand the story you're working with, uh, then there has to be areas that aren't in your story. Uh, and you could name those places, perhaps, or, or put rivers in that place, or some city in that place. But, uh, and then the viewer, as they're reading your book, uh, short story or novel, whatever, um, and they realize that that's not talked about. Uh, they might be making, they could make their own story. Or maybe it'll be in the sequel, <laughs> something. Uh, but it's just uh, making it, uh, I think, it, to be more successful, it needs to expand past the border of the story that's given. And... Uh, 
it, it's not easy really to do that, but I think it's important to do that. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I think it's kind of like a film adaptation, right? Like if it's just like a straightforward visualization of the text that doesn't add anything new, it feels quite reductive and it feels, like I remember when I saw the Harry Potter films for the first time when I was a kid and it just felt like that is not, it, the world did actually feel like smaller in a way because it just wasn't how I imagined it. Um, and so I think it is about like everything that lies beyond that. Um, and also the map just not being a straightforward visualization, the map being what a map is, which is a text, right? Um, and I think if we don't think of it as a text and we just think of it as like a way for the reader just to be able to tell, well, that's east of that, then it is just gonna feel, I think a lot of what fantasy is, is, it, is that sense of almost being lost in a text. And if you feel too found in it, then it doesn't feel as exciting. But if it feels like part of the text that is adding depth to the world, of how the world functions, not just how the world looks, um, then I think it's, yeah, makes it exciting. Thank you. The gentleman there, I think he's gone. Uh, yeah. Let me get the mic set up. This one's working. Um, that looks. Okay, I, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I'm going, I'm thinking of, um, well, I'm, I'm trying to think about, um, basically, um, I'm looking more at modern fantasy. Mm -hmm. it, you know, so something, so not quite Midlife, but something more like, you know, things, something similar to uh, 21st century uh, mapping. So basically, I would like to ask a question on how do you factor in modern things? So things like modern architecture, modern buildings, you know, you know modern, you know, road styles, you know, modern um, politics, for instance. Um, when considering um, making a modern style version of fantasy, you know, something based on the 21st century. Okay. Mm. I mean, Charles, I think you mentioned the, the, the Spider-Man and having to draw, uh, you oh, know... Windows. In windows and, uh, and New York Sky Crew. So, so how... how great, great question, but how, you know, how do we wrestle, how do we update, how do we move fantasy into the 21st century? Um, if we, if if that seems desirable or not, to. exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not particularly interested in that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, there would probably be all sorts of ways you could do that, uh, with, and it would be an interesting thing for someone to do, uh, a future, you know, future fantasy mm. or something, uh, and uh, yeah. Oh, that would take some thinking. You need to be at a bar, you need to have some whiskey <laughs> and a sketchbook and just start going and have two or three people and you'd have a conversation going and sketching. Uh, it, it could be fairly interesting. Uh, it's, again, you just you know, have to leave, leave space, make it bigger than the actual story that you're thinking of. So, uh, but in turn, if you're thinking of a map, then you're not really drawing the buildings. Uh, the roads would be different. Uh, they would be straighter than, than <laughs> a Tolkien map. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah, they go straight through the mountain, you know. Wouldn't matter about the Balrog down there. You just <laughs> build on through. <laughs> yeah, I think the big kind of change in like contemporary mapping is that contemporary mapping is digital right like that's right. really the big thing um, and it's something that a lot of like what I kind of talk about in the book in terms of the tension between mapping and the land is that a map is a static thing um, but the land changes and that becomes especially interesting when you think of like the Ents as like a moving forest but they're trying to like map the forest and control the forest but then the forest moves um, but that only really works if a map is static. And what is really interesting about modern mapping is that it isn't. Like, it is digital, and it allows for a certain amount of movement, which I think has its own, like, form of power. It doesn't make it any more objective, but it kind of creates a new sort of, like, language for a lot of this stuff. Um, so I think it would be kind of cool in a modern fantasy map to see what could be done within that digital scape. Um, and we see it even with, like, older... There are, like, various projects that have, like, digitized... Um, fancy maps, like that's a big part of like the digital humanities as well, is how does like technology and art kind of intersect. Um, and I think that would be probably the most modern expression of it that I could think of 
I mean, I guess the, the other question to follow on from that then is physical maps are, th are things that obviously we encounter, but mm. as, as time has go, goes on, most people are only going to see maps digitally and on their, and on their phone. Yeah. Is there a point where that, that tension becomes problematic mm. for fantasy maps because people don't yeah. connect with them in the same way that they would have done? Yeah, like do the kids know what a map is? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is yeah, yeah. <laughs> the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard. I think the imagination that we have of maps will still exist, yeah. but I think it will be building on an imagination of fantasy maps rather than maps themselves. So mm -hmm. it's like not doing that kind of same subversive thing maybe in the same way. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a brave new world. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it will happen, but I rather, I, the reason why I like the older style map is that it flows with the landscape, and I, mm. I, enjoy, I love landscape. I think there's a lot of power in it, and I, I like the fact that uh, you didn't go, well, it's more economical, and it's smarter if you make this road go straight through everything, uh, but I like it flowing with that landscape so you sort of know where you are. Uh, I, to me, the, the plowing, <laughs> plowing through the mountain and getting rid of the Valrogs is getting rid of the, the myth around you, and uh, I, I'd rather have uh, the flow of the land. Mm. And I wonder if that also relates to, you know, your point about Tolkien being a walker, but also the horses and stuff. Sure. That, that, the, that's how the landscape yeah. is. I'll read, uh, oh... I'm not going to remember his name. Modern writer writes lots about walking. Mm -hmm. um, Robert McFarlane. Robert McFarlane. That's it. <laughs> Read him. He's great. He is He's great. great. <laughs> Should we have maybe one final question? There's a woman there with the. Oh, are we out? Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> um, but, but I'm sure Anna and Charles will. Charles will be certainly looking about to sign copies of his book outside, and I'm sure he'll welcome questions and, and stuff. Yeah. So. Um, Thanks very much for attending this first session. Both. <laughs>